Okay, so <clears throat> um, we need then to talk about the concept of a mole. Um, and it's kind of a strange name for something, but obviously it comes from the word molecule. But when we talk about the interaction of one pure substance with another pure substance, that leads to a chemical change. And that's what we did in our lab, right? We, we had uh, magnesium and we had hydrochloric acid, and those two things interacted together and they led to a chemical change. We find out that chemical reactions occur according to how many particles of each substance is necessary for the reaction to occur. So a certain number of particles of one substance reacts with a certain number of particles of another substance or substances to form a certain number of particles and products. And two confusing things happen to us at this point. And both of these confusing things are related to the fact that we can't just go into the laboratory and count out certain numbers of particles of each pure substance. We've talked about this idea before that we can't measure numbers of particles, but this leads to some confusion because we have to use something in place of that if we're going to um, work uh, in the laboratory and, and accomplish chemical reactions. So the first thing that's confusing is while chemical equations tell us the smallest number of particles that interact with each other in the laboratory, the actual number of particles is so huge that we can't really comprehend it. We're talking about 10 to the 23rd particles in average chemical reactions. That's sextillion, hundreds of sextillions of particles that are, are interacting. And that's very difficult for us to comprehend. We, we don't have the brain power to envision that many particles interacting all at the same time. So what we need is a way to count numbers of particles by saying, we're going to call this really large number of particles a something. We're going to call it like a dozen or a gross. And then we'll use that to describe our reactions. And what we're going to call this something, you're already aware of this, is a mole. We're going to call this something a mole. But it's a number of particles that will seem very strange and confusing to us until we get used to it. When we see a dozen, we can visualize a dozen in our brain, right? We can say, oh, that's 12 things. And I can see a dozen eggs in an egg cart. And it's a number that makes sense. But the number that we're going to use for a mole is extremely weird. And it's going to, to confuse us. Second, because we don't have a device that can measure the amounts of particles for us, we have to rely on measuring amounts of substance by mass. Okay, in a laboratory, that's the only thing we have. But as the same number of particles of each different substance has a different mass, for example, particle or substance A may have a mass of 20 grams for each mole of particles, or substance B might have a mass of 24 grams for each mole. We have to also be able to figure out what substance that we're talking about. We need to be able to convert the number of moles uh, we need for a number of grams. And this sounds kind of simple, but it'll be pretty confusing to begin with. So this leads to our our learning targets. This confusion that we're going to feel is, is leading to our learning targets. First of all, I'll be able to define the mole and demonstrate my understanding that it's used to represent a number of particles of substance. I'll be able to define the term molar mass and determine the molar mass of any substance. I will be able to use my understanding of moles and molar mass to determine required masses of substance to perform a chemical reaction. And this is where we're really headed, right? I want to actually be able to use this in the chemistry laboratory. I want to be able to go into a chemistry laboratory and say, based on this chemical reaction, I need to get this many grams of this stuff, and I need to get this many grams of that stuff. And I expect that I will end up with a product containing this many grams. Okay, so the above skills 
are required in order to be able to understand and carry out laboratory investigations. And then what I expect you to do in terms of skills, I will expect you to be able to convert numbers of moles and parts of moles into numbers of particles, right? A mole is a certain number of particles, so why wouldn't I expect you to be able to say, well, if I have half a mole, how many particles is that? If I have 0.7596 moles, how many particles of substance is that? I will also expect you to be able to determine the molar mass of any pure substance, and we'll figure out what that is, although you should already have a pretty good idea. Given a balanced chemical equation, I will, I will expect you to be able to describe the features of the equation in words, and then given a balanced chemical equation and a beginning mass or set of masses, I will expect you to be able to determine the unknown masses in the reaction 80% of the time. Okay, so the concept of a mole then. So consider the following chemical equation. And I want you at this point to write down in this space here what you think this chemical equation says in words. Remember, in nature, when they're not combined with something else, hydrogen and oxygen are present as molecules. So we wouldn't call these atoms of hydrogen and oxygen. We would call them molecules of hydrogen and oxygen. But go ahead and write down what you think this chemical reaction says in words. It'll just take you 30 seconds to a minute or so. It looks like most of you are finished writing. So the pattern that I want you to think of when we see something like this is very simple. We're just going to look at what is it that I have in terms of types of particle. Is this a molecule or is this an atom? And then we're going to say, how many of these things do I have? And so the way that um, I would put this into word words is I'm going to say, two molecules of hydrogen, two molecules of hydrogen, and you don't have to change yours to, to fit this, uh, just kind of understand what we're trying to do here. Two molecules of hydrogen, and what, are, what is the hydrogen doing with the oxygen? It's reacting with it, right? Two molecules of hydrogen react with one molecule of oxygen to form two molecules of water. Okay. So the way that we're going to begin to understand what this concept means is to state in words what it means when we look at a chemical equation. And, and hopefully you'll agree that this is a lot more convenient than writing it out uh, in words. Two molecules of hydrogen react with one molecule of oxygen to form two molecules of water. That's a lot more convenient to say that. But our earliest understanding of this is that these are 
these coefficients, these numbers in front of the molecules or the atoms, uh, are going to tell us how many particles we have. I have two particles of this and one particle of this, and that gives me two particles of this. Okay, this is what I mean when I say this formula or this equation tells us what the smallest number of particles is that's going to interact, okay? At its lowest level, I need two of these and one of these to give me two of these. Again, when we go into the laboratory and actually do this, we're talking about 10 to the 23rd particles uh, of these things uh, interacting together, and that's a lot more difficult to think about. So again, that's the reason we need this, this word to tell us what this large number means. So if we wanted to go into the chemistry laboratory and perform oops, this chemical reaction, how would we measure out the amounts of hydrogen and oxygen molecules? And we've already said this is a confusing thing because I can't. One of the problems we have carrying out chemical reactions is that reactions occur according to how many particles of each reactant there are. In the above reaction, two particles of hydrogen react with one particle of oxygen to form two particles or molecules of water. And this is how I will want you to write out the, the reaction when I ask you to put this into words. I'll only do this a couple of times uh, just to check and make sure that you know how to do that on a, on a test. Um, but that's how you'll do that on a test. One thing that we can do to, to sort of visualize this is that we can diagram the reaction uh, and, and that will help us to, to visualize it a little bit better. And so we could use drawings of hydrogen and oxygen and water uh, to, to help us do this. And so the way that we would want to do something like this is that we know that hydrogen is covalently bonded to another hydrogen. Remember, hydrogen has one valence electron and the one valence electron shares with the other valence electron in the hydrogen molecule to form H2. And I have two of these. Okay, so remember, if I put two of these together, that's what's going to happen, right? If I put two hydrogens together, that's what's going to happen. If I have two oxygens, remember that each oxygen has six valence electrons. And if I put those two together, I've got these two electrons and I've got these two electrons that I can share. And so hopefully it would make sense that they're going to form a double bond. I can share two pairs of electrons there. So I'm going to say these hydrogen molecules plus this oxygen molecule, there's my double bond, but I still have the other two pairs. And notice what happens when I have this double bond. Remember this area of uh, negative electrical force pulls on the, uh, the protons in the nuclei of these two oxygen atoms and forms that bond, makes it more stable. But here are my two unshared pairs in each of these, and now each oxygen atom with the double bond has eight electrons around it. Okay, so that's my starting point. And then I'll show the bonds in my water molecules in another way. I'll use these lines here, and each of these lines represents a pair of electrons. It's easier to draw a line than it is to draw two dots, okay? And so it's just a little bit more convenient, and we would do it in that way. And so one of these oxygen atoms is going to take two of these uh, hydrogens, and this oxygen atom is going to take the other two, and they're going to form this molecule, okay? So visualizing this may help us understand a little bit more as well um, uh, how this reaction is, is going to take place, okay? And so having that in our brains, 
We already know why this is true. Why is it a problem for us in the lab that reactions occur according to numbers of ratios of reactant particles? Uh, I know that I have four hydrogen atoms to two hydrogen atoms here, um, and I will always react in this ratio. Four hydrogen atoms to two hydrogen atoms gives me two water molecules. But this is a problem for us because we can't measure particles. And we'll keep coming back to that and coming back to that because understanding this problem helps us understand the solution. Understanding this problem helps us understand the solution. Now, because we don't have a device that measures out atoms or molecules of substance, we have to find another way to measure these amounts. What measure of an amount of substance do we use in the laboratory? What, how do we measure things in the laboratory? Okay, that's the units. What's the property? What property of a substance do we use? The mass. Okay, so we've got the mass. Okay, so what measure of an amount of substance can we use in the laboratory? You can use mass. What unit might we select? So hopefully it makes sense that we can de decide how many particles of stuff we need to use and then figure out how many grams that number of course, uh, particles corresponds to. And I say draw a visual representation of this. All I really mean is number of particles number of grams. Okay. What I need to be able to do, a skill that I need to have is how do I turn a number of particles into a number of grams that I can go into the laboratory and figure out. Okay. And that's what we're going to figure out how to do next. Number of particles, number of grams. And we'll keep coming back to this again because telling yourself this is what we're doing, figuring out how we turn a number of particles into a number of grams is going to help us solidify our understanding. So from the periodic table, we know how many atomic mass units there are in H2 and O2. There are two atoms in each molecule, right? I've got two hydrogens and two oxygens. So if I look at the periodic table and it tells me that each hydrogen has a, an atomic mass of 1.01 atomic mass units, if I multiply that by two, and H2 has 2.02 atomic mass units, and an oxygen molecule ends up having 32 atomic mass units, okay? So, The second thing I have to do is I have two hydrogen molecules, so I'm going to have to multiply that again by two to give me 4.04 atomic mass units. Okay, so again, keep asking how many particles do I need? How many grams is this? How many particles do I need? I need four particles of this, and I need two particles of oxygen. And that's going to give me two molecules of water. So I need two particles of this and one particle of this. And that's going to give me two particles of this. But now I've said that's equal to 4.04 atomic mass units. That's equal to 32 atomic mass units. And that's equal to 36.04 atomic mass units. Now that's not the same thing as grams, right? This doesn't help us because we can't measure atomic mass units any more than we can measure numbers of particles. Nevertheless, this puts us on a path to understanding how this is going to work. 
I need two particles of this and one particle of this and two particles of this. And that's the same thing as saying this many atomic mass units. Okay? And I got that information from the periodic table. But it does seem to think, make things a little more complicated. But what if I know how many grams are in an atomic mass unit? And don't worry, you'll never have to know this unless I give the value to you on a test. But I know that one atomic mass unit is equal to this many grams. Okay? Now, that's an exceedingly small number of grams, and that's not really going to help us out a whole lot either. 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24th grams is equal to one atomic mass unit. So if I multiplied this for atomic mass units, I would get this many grams, 6.71 times 10 to the negative 24th. And I would get this many grams of oxygen. So we could say, and again, keep asking, how many particles do I need? How many grams is this? Now I figured out how many grams this is. Two particles of hydrogen and one particle of oxygen gives me two particles of water. And that's the same thing as saying this many grams of hydrogen and this many grams of oxygen and this many grams of water. But this still doesn't help us. We can't measure 10 to the negative 24th grams any more than we can measure particles. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Bye. Connor, you need to get something from the office. Okay. So... Right now, though, we're still a little confused because I can turn particles into grams, but what I've done so far doesn't really help me. It just actually made it more complicated. Well, let's see if we can turn this into something that we can actually measure in the laboratory. What if instead of using two molecules of hydrogen and one molecule of oxygen, let's multiply this by some outrageous number. Let's multiply... Uh, everything by a million. Let's say I have a million particles or two million particles of this and one million particles of this. It's the same ratio, right? Two million to one million. By the way, if you don't know this because of your math classes, you should be able to easily multiply things like this by using the exponents that you have been given. So if I've been given 6.71 times 10 to the negative 24th grams. And I said, hey, I want to multiply this by a million. Make sure you understand that a million is 10 to the 6th, right? 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. 1 million is 10 to the 6th. And all I need to do when I multiply things, right, with exponents, I add the numbers together. So all I have to do to multiply this by a million is just change the exponent to 10 to the negative 18th. Okay? So that's a useful thing on standardized tests. If you don't know that, now you do know that. Be able to do this kind of thing. All you need to do is just add 6 to negative 24, and you get 10 to the negative 18th. So I've done that. I've multiplied everything by a million. And now I get this many grams of hydrogen, and this many grams of oxygen gives me this many grams of water. That's a million times what we were talking about before. And I can trace this all the way back to two particles of this, one particle of this, and two particles of this. But guess what? I still can't measure that. doesn't help me. What if I multiplied things by a billion more? What if we multiply things by another billion? What if I add another 9 to this? I get 10 to the negative 9th and 10 to the negative 8th, which is a billion times this, which is a million times this, which is the same as this, which is the same as 2 to 1 to 2. Everything here is still 2 to 1 to 2. 
okay, represents two to one to two. Okay, but this still doesn't help me. So finally, let's say, what if instead of using two quadrillion molecules, which is what we have right now, I had 10 to the sixth times 10 to the ninth times that original number. I have, instead of having two quadrillion molecules of hydrogen and one quadrillion molecules of oxygen, what instead is if, what, what if we used 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd? And again, because I have two molecules of hydrogen, I would multiply that times two. And then 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of oxygen. And, you know, we were going before in a nice uniform pattern. I was multiplying by multiples of 10, right? I multiplied by a million. I multiplied by a billion. And so that I had even numbers. But now I'm throwing this number. Let's multiply everything by this number. And we have to stop and scratch our heads and say, where did we come up with this number? Okay, and that's what I'm going to tell you. It turns out that if we have this number of particles of any element, if I go to the periodic table and I look at that element, let's say I go to lithium and I look at that element and I notice that it's got an atomic mass of 6.94 atomic mass units, the number of grams equal to the atomic mass, 6.94 grams, would have this many particles in it. Okay? So if I go to any element on the periodic table and I look at its atomic mass, what is its atomic mass? What is its atomic mass? If I have one oxygen atom, its atomic mass is 16. If I say, well, what if I have 16 grams of that? I will have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of that. Okay? If I go to chlorine and say the atomic mass is 35.45 atomic mass units, well, what if I have 35.45 grams of chlorine? I will have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles. What if I look at nitrogen? It says I have an atomic mass of 14.01 atomic mass units. If I say, well, what if I have 14.01 grams of that? Then you will have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles. Okay, so that's where this number comes from. It's because if I turn the atomic mass into a number of grams, that's how many particles I will have of that substance. Okay, if I turn that number into grams, that's how many particles I'll have of that substance. So this is where that number comes from. And, oh, by the way, we're just going to call that one mole of particles. One mole of stuff is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd grams. If I have one atom of hydrogen, its atomic mass is 1.01. If I have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, the mass is 1.01 grams. If I have molecules of hydrogen, I'm going to have to multiply that times two, right? And the mass of one mole of hydrogen molecules is 2.02 .02 grams. If I have two moles of hydrogen molecules, the mass is 4.04 .04 grams. So how many particles do I need? How many grams is this? If I need two moles of this and one mole of this, That's wrong. I should get two moles of water. Change that to two moles of water in your notes. Right? Here I go from two particles, two particles of this, to two moles to one mole to two moles of this. 
then I can easily say two moles of this is 4.04 grams, one mole of this is 32.00 grams, and two moles of this should be 36.04 grams of water. Okay? All the time in the back of your brain, you know that one mole of each of these things is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles. Okay? The person that figured this out for us in the 1850s, Avogadro, his full name is Lorenzo Romano Amadeo Carlo Avogadro de Carrega e de Cireto. This is a name I would like to have because it's so cool. Lorenzo Romano Amadeo Carlo Avogadro. Anyway, he is given credit for the discovery of this number. We now identify any quantity of matter containing this number of particles as a mole of that substance. Okay, so 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of helium is one mole of helium and its mass is 4.003 grams. I get that from the periodic table. One mole of scandium has a mass of 44.69 grams. One particle of scandium has a mass of 44.96 atomic mass units. One mole of palladium is 106.42 grams. One mole of bismuth is 208.98 grams. Where do I go to find out how much mass is in one mole of any substance? Periodic table, right? Okay. A mole is defined as 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles of a given substance. Again, we don't have vocab in this class. How many atoms are in one mole of silicone? How many atoms are in one mole of silicone? What's the number of particles in one mole? How many atoms are in one mole? 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Okay. It takes a while for it to sink in. What is the mass of one mole of silicone? On your phones, look up the molar mass of silicone. Because you can't really read it off your periodic table. So, question, molar mass of silicone. Um. 28.0855. We'll round that up to 28.09 grams per mole. Okay, the units are important here. I have this many grams in one mole. How many atoms are in one mole of boron? How many atoms are in any mole of anything? 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. But what is the mass of one mole of boron? So look up the molar mass of one mole of boron. Ten point eight one grams per mole. Okay, and so you can see that you'll probably want to find the mass of one mole of potassium and one mole of zirconium as well. How many atoms are in one mole of potassium? Okay, I think it's 30.9 something. What's the molar mass of potassium? 30.39? Oh, I'm sorry. 39.09? I was way off, wasn't I? Grams per mole. Oh. Actually, is it 39.01 or 39.10? What is that round? What's the next number? Okay, so it rounds up. I thought I remembered that. Okay. And then 
6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. What is the mass of zirconium? Who's got the molar mass of zirconium? 91.22 91.22 grams per mole. Okay. Now, is there anyone that would not be able to figure out how many atoms are in one mole? Okay, it's pretty consistent, right? It's the same thing every time. I have this many atoms in one mole, 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 but the masses of one mole are different. So in order for me to figure out how much mass I'm going to need to use in the laboratory, I have to go to the periodic table, find out what the atomic mass is, and then say, oh, by the way, that's also the mass in grams in one mole. Okay. So we give the mass in grams of an element that's equal to its atomic weight, a special name, since it's the mass in one mole. It should make sense that we're going to call it the molar mass. We turn mole into an adjective. What mass is it? It's the mass in one mole. Mass in one mole. Grams per mole. Okay. Now that we know this, we have to figure out how to use it. Okay. Now, ultimately, this is going to seem a little bit silly, but it will help you figure out how we're going to use this. The atomic weight of sodium is 22.99. How many grams are in one mole? 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd would be the number of particles. How many grams are in one mole? We're going to say 22.99. So you wouldn't round it up fast? Though. Nope. We can measure in our laboratory to thousands of grams. So we would want to at least measure to hundreds of grams. And, and most atomic masses are given to hundreds of grams. Okay? Now, so we can kind of see this where this is going. If I had two moles, how many grams would I have? 45.98. 45 Some of you could have done that in your head. I'm just multiplying the number by two, right? How about 4.6 moles? Did you multiply that already? Yeah, 0.754. Okay, so we'll round that to hundreds. Okay, 4.6 moles. Okay. I'm going to let you work on this for a couple of minutes. Um, just uh, figure out by analogy how many grams in one mole, how many grams in one mole, how many grams in these other numbers of moles, and then speculate, tell me, if I want to find the number of grams in a given number of moles, what would my approach be? How am I going to find the number of grams in a given number of moles? So fill the rest of those in. And you can use your calculator or your phone as a calculator. And if you're at a table with another person, you can work on it together.
Yeah. So I just want to make sure that it's wrapping up there. Okay. So for atomic mass of cesium, you're going to put 132.91? I just put 0.97 wrong. Nope. Well, it's not entirely wrong. Again, I want those to, the, but atomic weights, we're dealing with atomic weights. I want to go to hundreds. But certainly round to the hundreds. So what did we get for 1.45 moles of cesium? 192.72. And then what about 18.1? Then what about 0.53 moles of titanium? And then 3.67. Okay, now the other thing that you should be able to do as you're thinking about how to do this is you should just simply be able to look at the number of moles that you have and make a prediction about about how many grams you're going to have. If I have 132 grams in one mole and I say, well, what if I have about one and a half moles? You're going to think, well, 132, if I, if I multiply that times one and a half, it's going to be about 190, okay? Or if I multiply this by something that's about 20, I'm going to end up with about 2,600, and your value is very close to that. So uh, being able to make these estimates helps you make sure that you're on the right track. So if I want to find the number of grams in a given number of moles, what is my approach going to be? What do I do with the number of grams and the number of, or the number of moles in the molar mass? You multiply them together, right? Multiply moles. times molar mass, and we'll abbreviate molar mass mm. So if I were to be able to write a mathematical formula for this, I would say grams equals moles times molar mass. Now, I want you to realize that you don't need to memorize this, and you will forget it, but you know that the molar mass equals grams Per mole. You know that the word molar mass means grams in one mole, mass in one mole. And so you can't really forget this formula now, right? The name tells you what the formula is. Molar mass, mass in one mole. Molar mass, mass in one mole. You can't forget that now. But if you know that the molar mass is the mass in one mole and you want to find the number of moles, you just switch these two numbers. That's an algebra trick. If I want to find out what this value is in a denominator, I can just switch it with whatever's on the other side, and that will give me the correct formula. So that would give me moles equals grams divided by molar mass. Or I'm sorry, I'm going the other way here. My bad. I just need to multiply both sides of the equation by moles, right? My bad. If I multiply that side of the equation by moles and that side of the equation by moles, I get moles times molar mass. Okay? So if I know this formula, if I know this formula, molar mass equals grams divided by moles, I can always find 
what the number of grams is by multiplying both sides of the equation by a number of moles. Okay? And you will need to know this equation, but you'll always be able to figure it out. Now what if I do the other way? What if I go the other way? What if I say the atomic weight of sodium is 22.99? How many moles contain 22.99 grams? And it's not a trick question. It's one mole, right? One mole contains 22.99 grams. How many moles contain 400 grams? Wouldn't I take what? Yes. Okay. I'm going to take this value and divide it by 22. If this is in one mole, how many moles are in this? So I'm going to say 417.4 divided by 22.99. 18.16 moles. Okay. Um, how many grams is 2.156 kilograms? Kilo means what? Thousand. Thousand. So 2,156 grams. Just throwing you a new unit there. So if that's that many grams, how many moles? And again, you can sort of estimate here, right? If I've got 2,156 versus 22, that should be approaching 100 moles, shouldn't it? Yeah, 93.78. 93.78. Okay, so you can kind of reason this out by using this thinking. Go ahead and do the rest of these and then tell me if you want to find the number of moles in a given number of grams, what would your approach be? And if you want, go ahead and create a chemical formula for that. Or mathematical formula. So there's what I get, 0.11 and 1.03 and 3.32 and 0.014. And again, you can check your work very easily here, right? If you have 136.7 grams and you know that one mole is this many grams, you can see that this is very close to one mole. 
if I know that I have 160 grams and I have about 50 grams in one mole, I know that this is going to be fairly close to three moles. Okay, so you can check your work fairly easily. If I know that I have about 130 and I have about 14 grams here, 15 grams, that's about one tenth, right? So you can check that work very easily. So what's my approach to finding the number of moles? You divide. Divide grams by molar mass, right? And that gives us a formula moles equals grams divided by molar mass. Okay, and again, it all comes from this formula, molar mass equals grams per mole. This is what I was talking about before when I was thinking about the wrong thing. And that should be evidence to you. I've done this for years and years and years and years. And even I have to stop and think about these three equations occasionally. Okay, I have to make sure I'm working with the right one by going back to the original equation. Here, if I have something in the denominator that I want by itself on one side of the equation, I just switch those two things. And now I have moles equals grams divided by molar mass. That's the algebra trick I was talking about. Just switch those two things if you um, haven't become aware of that already. So I start with molar mass equals grams per mole, and then I have grams equals, and I multiply both sides of the equation by moles, moles times molar mass, and then I have moles equals grams divided by molar mass. Now, I will always give you this equation on a test, molar mass is grams per mole, although I shouldn't need to, but you will have to figure out these two formulas on your own on a test, okay? I will always give you this, but I'm trusting you to be able to figure out these other two formulas. So if I ask for a number of grams, you can immediately write this formula down and see if you have the information to solve it. If I ask for a number of moles, you can write this number or formula down and see if you have the information to solve it. Okay, and you're always going to be able to find the molar mass, right, by looking at what? Okay, the periodic table, right? Okay, so one last thing then. Given the number of moles of compound, you can find the number of grams in the same way you did for single elements. If you know the mass of the compound, given the number of grams of a compound, you can find the number of moles in the same way you did for single elements. Okay? Now, um, you can work on that on your own. Um, it would be done in exactly the same way. We're not going to talk about molarity at all today. We'll save that for another time. Um, but uh, um, I, I want to also show you how to find the molar mass of one of these compounds. Okay? So under here, under this last section here, uh, write down molar mass of compounds okay molar mass of compounds and let's say for example we have this one here sodium bicarbonate and we recognize that since sodium ends the left side of the um, the formula this is an ionic compound because this is a metal, and then this must be a polyatomic ion. This is a polyatomic ion we haven't seen before. It's called the bicarbonate ion. You don't need to know that. 
You just need to know how to figure out how to find its molar mass. So if I were to say molar mass of NaHCO3, and I want to figure that out, how would, how would you speculate that I'm going to find that? How am I going to find the mass of that compound? Take it apart. Take it apart? Like when you just add the molar mass of all the elements. Uh-huh. Except what am I going to do with the O3? Two or three times. I'm going to have to multiply that times three. So here's what I want you to do with these kinds of things. I know that the molar mass of sodium is 22.99, so I'm going to multiply that times one plus... 1 times the molar mass of hydrogen, which is 1.01, .01, plus 1 times the molar mass of carbon, which is 12.01, .01, plus 3 times the molar mass of oxygen, which is 16.00. Okay, this will be the only time I will allow you not to use units because it becomes way too obnoxious to add the grams per mole in there, okay? So 1 times 22.99 plus 1.01 .01 plus 1 times 12.01 .01 plus 3 times 16. And if you look up here, that's already calculated out to be 84.06, I'm sorry, 84.01 .01 grams per mole, okay? I'm always going to expect you to use units though in a final answer okay so my expectation will be that anytime you need to find the molar mass of a compound you will write it out like this and show me this work the only thing that I'll allow you not to do is you don't have to put one in front of an element that has just one atom okay you certainly have to multiply everything else times the subscript. But if the subscript is one, I will allow you not to write down the one. You can just write down 22.99 plus 1.01 .01 plus 12.01 .01 plus three times 16. That's how you're going to show me that you know how to find the molar mass of a compound. Okay. So, how are we feeling about the concept of a mole? And the idea of converting grams to moles. I have to convert grams to moles. And let me just show you an example of, real quick, why we need to do that. So let's say we have um, our, our, the form of the example we've been using, two hydrogens plus uh, one oxygen gives me two H2Os. And let's say I don't have a nice even amount of, of hydrogen. Let's say I have uh, 4.93 grams of hydrogen, okay? And I want to know how many grams of oxygen to use to react with that. Well, I'm going to have to turn that into a number of moles, right? Because I know that I'll need two times the number of moles of, of, this, uh, of this. So if I say that I have 4.93 grams, 4.93 grams divided by a molar mass, and remember H2 has a molar mass of 2.02, .02, so I have 2.44 moles of this. I have 2.44 moles of H2. Well, I need half that amount of oxygen, okay? So I need half of 2.44, which is 1.22. So I need 1.22 moles of this. And now I can figure out how many grams of oxygen I need. If I need 1.22 moles of O2, 
I remember that the the atomic mass or the molar mass of oxygen molecules is 32. So I'm going to multiply 1.22 times 32, and that means I need 39.04 grams of this. And since I use two moles of this, I'm going to get two moles of this. That also means if I use 2.44 moles of this, I'm going to get 2.44 moles of water. And I could either add these two numbers of grams together to get how many grams of water I would expect. So if I did that, I would say 4.93 plus 39.04 equals, I would expect 43.97 grams of water. Or I could find out what the molar mass of water is, H2O is 16 plus 2.02, so its molar mass is 18.02, and I can multiply 18.02 times 2.44, and that also gives me 43.97 grams, okay? So we'll be using this to find out how many grams of another substance I need to react with a certain amount of this, or how many grams of this will I expect to, to get. Okay, so we're going to have to keep working back and forth and back and forth between grams and moles in order to use this correctly. So that's where we're headed with that. Next time, I will actually have an assignment that works on this uh, that I'm going to let you work on in class, okay? Instead of actually doing outside of class, I'll let you work on it in class. Next time. Questions about this? Things that you're confused about? Okay. And it'll become a lot clearer when we actually start working on these things.